So, so well, good afternoon or good morning, uh, everybody. So I'm uh, Emanuele Angel Antonio. I'm director of the BTAU Internal Salt and Genomics. And uh, it's real pleasure to host uh, for this seminar a trio of uh, a stellar presenter, uh, Connie Westhoff, uh, William Owen, and Nick Little. And I'm really glad that I come here to present the, some of the work that I've been uh, doing over the last few years. And I think it's really sort of planned to revolutionize the, the, the blood uh, transfusion and actually the, the blood group genotyping. So, uh, well, without the, I don't think they need too much interaction and I'll leave uh, the floor to uh, the trio. Um, good. Um... It's a real pleasure to be back. Um, normally I would have walked across to strange ways, um, but at least I'm sitting on the campus at the hospital. Um, and welcome to everyone to this uh, symposium about blood groups. And uh, first, the work we got to present would have not been possible without the international dimension. It's great to have Corny Westhoff from the New York Blood Center joining today. But I think for those at uh, public health and primary care, uh, it definitely wouldn't have been possible with your amazing uh, work on the interval compare and now strides uh, studies, which have been led by the PHPC and have laid a platform for the work we go to share with you. So Nick, if I can have the next slide, it feels very throwback to ask for the next slide. So I think uh, Nick Laddell, who you may know of because you have worked with him, uh, and otherwise he will speak later, uh, was at Confil and Keys, like Robert Fischer was at Confil and Keys, the first professor of genetics in the world. Um, comes very much from uh, a background outside human genetics, but uh, later in his career got seriously interested in human genetics. And this was in part fired up by his collaboration with Ruth Sanger related to Fred, uh, who invented uh, Sanger sequencing, obviously, and uh, her husband, Ray's, Rob Ray's, who they worked together with on blood group genetics. And I think the words from Fischer that he wrote in the book, Blood Groups in Men, what is the Bible for anyone who is into in blood transfusion, was very profound. Nine usable loci is surely to have gone a long way towards establishing the basic triangulation by which in due time, the whole will be surveyed. And he said this in 1950, mm -hmm. 70 years ago. And Nick, if you can just click in the next one. And he was referring, there were no DNA markers, but there were antibodies against blood groups. And he was referring to the five blood groups that they recognized D, C, little c, little e, and big C, and big E. And what you see in this two color cartoon from the MRC memorandum of 1952, which was written by this group, but had a lot of work from Fischer included in this MRC leaflet. And if you don't believe it exists, um, I just want to show you uh, here the, uh, the cover of the book. Uh, he proposed that rare haplotypes in the population did arise from crossing over events that were rare and therefore explained that there were haplotypes that are less frequent that had arisen from those that you see at the bottom of this cartoon. It's very interesting if you go back in the history, he worked with Morin and they traveled around the world to establish the frequencies of those markers and the markers of the ABO blood groups and some other blood groups of the early days to create a hap map for 1950. So it was precisely the same what has happened uh, again, uh, decades later, under the HapMap initiative. Nick, if we go to the next slide. So I think in a good Cambridge style, Cambridge has made its contribution to the safety of blood transfusion. First, I think that laid the ground for the double helix. Then Coombs came, but led to the definition of the RH blood groups and the introduction of the Coombs test was instrumental in 1950 
And I remember seeing in the Netherlands a picture of Dutch doctors traveling to Cambridge to be taught how to do the Coombs test. If we then go to 1989, when I arrived in Cambridge, um, Greg Winter, Michael Neuberger, and Cesar Milstein set up at that time Cambridge Antibody Technology, but I was driven at high speed to Slough by one of my colleagues, Douglas Folk, and I was so pleased to arrive in Slough alive. Um, and he said, don't tell anyone. Thousands of liters of monoclonal NTA and monoclonal NTB based on Cecil Milstein's discovery of monoclonal antibody technology for which he got the Nobel Prize. And then later, Nevin used Jones and Marion Scott from Bristol, but Nevin was here in Cambridge at the LMB, made the monoclonal antibodies, the first generations to type for RHD. Again, a major step forward in increasing the accuracy by which you could type the blood groups AVO and D. And then let's go to now. It's the combination of Fred Sanger and then John Silston, who established the Sanger Institute, and not to forget Shankar, who's a fellow at my college, who developed the Illumina high throughput sequencing, which allowed us to go for whole genome sequencing, as has been applied to Interval, but also it has allowed us to get a much better understanding of the structures of the genes because of the Human Genome Project. So next slide, Nick. So what is the clinical problem? Because you can say, Willem, you have told us already that blood transfusion and blood matching is safe. At the moment, there's an estimated 1.4 million donations made per year in England, 700,000 women, 700,000 men who give their pint of blood. That is used for 700,000 transfusion episodes and although we don't have precisely accurate figures, around four to 5% of these transfusion episodes result in the formation of antibodies against other blood groups than ABO and RHD for which matching is taking place. To support these 35,000 patients that have been immunized, at least one and a half thousand scientific staff are working in the 280 hospitals to prevent these patients from getting so-called mismatched blood, what would lead to a hemolytic transfusion reaction that can either be lethal or completely negate the effect of the transfusion. So then the next step where we want to evolve to, yeah, thanks Nick, we want to evolve to position transfusion medicine. We really felt that it was we needed to set up an international collaboration where we bring together blood services from around the world, together with experts from New York, Boston, Cambridge, and other places to bring genotyping to the front line to reduce this number of immunization from 35,000 to 30,000 by providing better matched blood. I would like now to hand over to Connie Westhoff who truly is the global expert in blood group genetics and will give you further insight in the genes and the proteins that are underlying the other blood groups besides ABO and D. Thank you very much. Thank you, Willem. Um, it's my pleasure to, to join my colleagues across the pond and um, to have the opportunity to share a little uh, bit of the US um, blood system set up with you today and to talk a little bit about why this collaboration um, led by Willem is so important to us in the US also. So um, in the US, you probably are aware, maybe not, that we don't have a national health system. We don't have a national blood system. Um, the American Red Cross handles about 40% of transfusions in the US and the rest are all done by independent blood centers. This was all started early in the days of transfusion in the 40s and 50s um, as community efforts. So community, your community supplied your blood transfusion needs and it was all very local. 
Um, that's certainly changed over the years. And um, it is really quite a bit of a challenge in the US because we now have many, many, many blood centers um, and we compete with each other. So um, in the American way, um, it's supply and demand and competition, but we're all nonprofits. So what has happened over the last few years is, is the merging of many blood centers. And the New York Blood Center, these are all our locations now. Um, in the last four years, we have merged with um, blood centers in the Midwest and on the East Coast. And we handle about 1.2 million donations from our enterprise now um, established um, a year. And this really works very well because blood moves all across the US and donors in the Midwest are, are very loyal. Um, sometimes New York donors um, feel they're too busy. And so um, really it's supply and demand and, and blood moves across the country. Next slide. Um, but I would like to make the point that um, the New York Blood Center has always prided themselves in being a leader in um, transfusion along with the UK, of course, uh, the long history of the UK's um, contribution to blood groups is, is well known. Um, but our reach in the US is a little bit broader in that we have established a national center for blood group genomics right in the center of the country. And we do genotyping for many other blood centers. And one of our biggest customers is the Vitalant blood system with 120 different sites and also some independent blood centers shown there in red. So I just make this point that um, blood in the U.S. is is a all country um, um, service, and that we we do feel we have a, a national impact from New York. Next slide. So um, I'm just going to step back a minute and and make sure we we all understand what we're talking about here. Um, what is a blood group type? You're probably all aware of your ABO and RH type. Um, so we define a blood group as a difference between individuals. We call these polymorphisms. It's either on your red blood cells or your platelets or your white blood cells. Of course, your ABO and RH are well known, but we call these ant differences antigens. So these are blood group antigens and they're inherited. They are different in different ethnicities and they're defined by a gene. And the practice of transfusion medicine is all based on blood groups and the immune response to foreign blood groups. So um, if you do not have the same proteins on your red cells as the transfused red cells, it causes an immune response and production of an antibody. And this happens through transfusion and also through pregnancy. Next slide. So this slide is just meant to show you um, what we're talking about here, these blood group structures on the red cell membrane. They have many different names. Um, they've been named by the letters of the alphabet. Um, they've also been named according to the families in which they were discovered. For example, the Kell system was discovered in 1946 and was named for Mrs. Kelher. She had a, a fetus who um, suffered from hemolytic disease of the newborn. And she had made this antibody to a paternal antigen carried on the red cells of the fetus. Um, so at, in the 40s and 50s, we, we actually published family names. We don't do that anymore, but many of these systems are named after the family in which they were discovered. And for example, the Kel protein, oops, one more back. Um, is one of 35 different antigens carried on that one single protein you see in the middle of the slide there, KEL. There's 30, we know of 35 differences in that protein between individuals that can cause an immune response and a, blood, a different blood group antigen. Thanks, Nick. Next slide. So what is this whole um, arena of blood? How many blood types are there? How many blood groups are there? Um, each year we add a few more. There are now 353 red cell antigens encoded by 48 different genes. Um, so this slide shows 
from the left, the discovery of ABO in the 1900s, the discovery of RH in the 1940s, and then all of the blood group systems we've discovered since then. And there's quite a few over on the right-hand side. Um, this is all um, the result of genomics and a genetic approaches. Um, we've known of these immunization events, but we're now able to put a name on them and a carrier protein on them with the, the, the wonderful world of genomics. Um, but back in ABORH time, we, we, have, we match people by their ABO and RH for the last 70 years. And so what we're talking about here is we know of all these other polymorphisms. Can we now begin to address um, matching patients and donors for more than ABO and RH, which we've been doing successfully for 70 years, but can we do better? Next slide. Why would we want to do something different? Um, as Willem alluded, two to three per percent of transfused patients make an antibody to a foreign antigen. Um, even more so in patients who are chronically transfused, like our sickle cell patients or our thalassemic patients. 35% or more make an antibody. And it's been an accepted risk of transfusion in the absence of a cost-effective way to prevent the reaction. What does it cause? Complicates pregnancy and potentially the fetal outcome. It increases cost of every subsequent transfusion, delay in care, and it's life-threatening in an emergency. And in the US alone, um, we estimate we are sensitizing 640 patients a day, certainly based on 32,000 transfusions a day in the US, certainly pre-COVID. And is this acceptable medical, medical practice now in the, in the age of genomics? Next slide. And the thing that concerns most of us even more is that 65% of these antibodies drop to undetectable levels. Well, what we try to do pre-transfusion is actually try and detect if a patient has an antibody. Um, and if we can't detect 65% of them until we transfuse the unit and the patient has a reaction, that's an unacceptable um, outcome. So. We are asking ourselves at this point, what's the value of the antibody screen and cross-match for detecting compatibility if 65% of the, the time you can't detect the patient's antibody because it's not present in a high enough level. Okay, next slide. So I would like to make the case that we can really have the opportunity with genomics to improve patient care and the transfusion efficacy um, with genomics. But I'd also like to make the point that this is going to make a huge operational um, efficient contribution to our blood centers using a genomic approach. And it's going to allow us to do higher resolution blood typing. And so I want to show you briefly what higher resolution blood typing means and what the operational efficiencies might be. Next slide. Thanks. So we've been concerned in New York about Allo immunization and its connection to our very diverse New York population for over 30 years. Um, the population uh, in New York is well, well known to be very diverse. 36% of New Yorkers are foreign born. And we have this um, reversed um, population distribution where 35% um, are European Caucasians, but 28% um, of our population is black or Hispanic and Latino and 10% are Asian. Um, so we've always been very focused. We've always seen more antibodies than um, our um, sister and brother hospitals out in, in the, the Midwest and other areas where it's much less ethnically diverse, but antibody production and transfusion reactions have been a major problem in the New York area. And so over 30 years, we've tried to mitigate this by actually, um, Next slide. Actually um, looking to our ethnic diverse donors and doing more typing of them. And we started this program in the 90s called a Precise Match Blood Donor Program, where um, we offered to our donors the ability to declare their ethnicity, 
Uh, and then their samples were tested for many different blood group antigens to try and expand our diverse blood donor supply. And we had over 7,000 of these kinds of units uh, frozen um, for different ethnic um, transfusion problems. Next, next slide. But this cost a lot in resources and labor because how do we do, did, do this testing for 30 years? We did it by serologic typing of red cells. And that's based on agglutination where you use an antibody and you add the red cells and you look for agglutination. Um, it requires a sensitive and specific antibody reagent, which is very expensive. And there's no commercial typing reagents for many antigens. Um, I told you there were over 300 antigens and we have commercial antisere for maybe 30 of those antigens. And it's very labor intensive. Um, as you can see from the slide, um, it actually um, requires manual reading and um, recording. So operationally, we need an alternative for typing. What do I mean by higher resolution blood typing? This is kind of a complex slide, but I wanted to make the point that your RH type, which you probably all know, is more than being positive or being negative. Um, shown on the top here are the two genes that encode the RH antigens, the D gene on the left and the CE gene on the right. And if you're RH positive, you have the D gene and you have that D proteins uh, shown as a squiggly line through the membrane and you have CE proteins. Now, if you're RH negative, which is 17% of Europeans, 5% uh, of Africans, and less than 1% of Asians, you don't have a D gene. Um, your red cells are just fine. Your CE proteins take care of structurally. Um, there's not a problem. Um, but this would be very simple if this was all there was to the RH system. But next slide will show you that um, there's a lot more than being positive or negative. We now know of 711 different alleles at the RHD locus, and that increases every year. And at the CE locus, we now know of 175 different alleles. That means 175 different proteins at the CE locus and 711 different proteins at the RH locus, which all have the um, potential to cause an immune response in um, in the recipient. So we have five reagents to type for all of these diverse proteins. Um, we type for simple D, C, little c, big E, and little e antigens in the RH system. But we don't know about all um, from the typing uh, whether the patient is carrying one of these altered alleles. So next slide. When we actually looked at um, um, our patients with sickle cell disease, this is a thousand patients genotyped. They had 13 different D alleles. 34% um, of patients had something that was different than what we call the conventional allele. And in kind on the next slide, you see RHCE diversity in our sickle cell patients, 14 different CE alleles among our, our sickle patients. Um, and 72% of the patients had something that differed from um, what we call conventional allele. Next slide. Um, and this slide is just meant to summarize that our patients and our donors are just as diverse. So we know there's the potential to do a better match for our patients because on the very bottom line, we show that 30% of our patients had an altered D, but 25% of our donors have those same altered Ds and the same with CE. So it, it does indicate to us that we can do a better match for our patients because we do have those matches in our donor population. Next slide. So uh, I just wanna give you one example um, um, and then move to Nick here uh, that drove this um, guidance in, for sickle cell disease to move to genotyping. And one of the prime motivators was this C antigen typing problem. Next slide. So we, we knew there were patients who type as C positive, but they make this antibody that's anti-C and it's clinically significant and it destroys transfused cells. But when we look genetically, 
at these patients who make this antibody on the top line there. That's their RH haplotype. Um, and on the bottom, I have the donor haplotype. These are very different loci uh, in the C positive patient and the C positive blood donor. They don't, they aren't a match. And one third of our patients who type to C positive have this altered genetic background and 40% had made an anti-C. So genotyping for sickle cell disease will distinguish um, the type of C antigen that's present and patients can be treated accordingly. Um, and this was one of the major motivators for um, the recommendation that sickle cell typing for patients be moved to genotyping. So next slide, thanks, Nick. Um, so we've been doing clinical reporting for genotyping for since 2006. And I show four different methods we use here. We do use DNA arrays, we use lab developed tests. Um, my point being here that we need a simpler way, straightforward way. We need a less labor intensive way to do this. Next slide. Because overall, um, from the National Laboratory, we um, genotype about 48,000 donors and patients a year. And in the New York Laboratory, we, we um, genotype about 6,000 patients a year. And this is done with a staff of six at the National Center and six in New York. And um, this is a, a, a huge commitment of time, labor, and cost. Um, that we hope to negate or mitigate with moving to this consortium array that you'll hear from Nick. Um, next slide. And toward this goal, uh, we work very closely with Bill Lane uh, at Brigham, who has developed uh, in collaboration with us an algorithm for actually interpreting large whole genome data sets also array data sets, et cetera. So uh, we're very excited in, in the US about this collaboration that's led by Willem and with Nick's efforts. Um, and we look forward to continued collaboration with, with the UK who have always been leaders in this area. Thank you for your attention. Nick, up to you. Cool, hi, hi everyone. Um, sorry about my rubbish job with the slides. Um, so, so my name is Nick um, and I'm a postdoc um, at the University of Cambridge and I work in genomics and blood transfusion. I've been working with uh, Willem and Connie, uh, obviously as part of the BGC. And I'm gonna talk to you a bit today about some of the technologies that um, we're developing and specifically this regulatory approval project that's now ongoing. Um, oh, I can't even do my own slides. So um, back in 2017, um, I'm going to start with a history lesson like uh, Willem and Connie both have. Um, so back in 2017, uh, Connie was as famous as she ever is, just coming fresh out of a blood bank guy interview. Um, Willem was just being Willem. Uh, Ellen's skiing career had come to a dramatic end and uh, the, uh, the tribute band that me, Barbara and Bill tried to put together just really wasn't taking off. So we all met in San Diego and um, the BGC was formed. And the aim of the BGC was to unite um, the New York Blood Center, Brigham and Women's Hospital, um, Sanquin, the Dutch Blood Foundation, uh, and NHS Blood and Transplant and Oxford Cambridge University with uh, an industrial partner, Thermo Fisher. Um, and our initial project, our first aim was to use genotyping arrays for typing human blood groups. Uh, and the way that we started to do this is uh, we selected an array that was already in use, uh, which was the Axiom UK Biobank array. Uh, and you might be familiar with that because it's the one that we used for the UK Biobank, but it was also the array that was initially selected, that was initially used uh, in interval uh, on large scale, uh, large amounts of blood donors. And so what we did is, um, if you look at this uh, figure on the right, uh, we took the array data and we looked to see if it could type human blood groups. Uh, and then we started to say, okay, well, there's this genetic variant missing, there's that genetic variant missing. And so we started building on top of the Axiom UK uh, Biobank array uh, and incorporated all the variants required for blood group types. 
And we kept trialing this uh, on DNA samples from blood donors and then comparing back to their blood service serology. Uh, and the final version was trialed on DNA uh, from just under 8,000 English and Dutch blood donors who were enrolled in the Compare and Donor Information Study 3 or DIS 3 studies. Um, and uh, the basic workflow was to take array data, uh, run it through blood typer, which incorporates all of the information from the field about the link between blood group phenotype, so your blood group and your genetics, uh, and to then translate that information into a blood report um, for use. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So on these 8,000 uh, English and Dutch blood donors, um, we, we took their genotyping data inferred their blood groups from it, and then started comparing back to the, donor, the blood groups on donor record uh, in uh, NHSBT and Sanquin respectively. Um, and for the comparison set, we used, there were 48 blood group antigens out of these 300 that Connie was talking about that were typed in both serology and were also available in the genotyping data set. And um, what you can see here in this figure up top here is just a heat map um, and each row uh, is an antigen. And on the y-axis, we just have donor. So donor number one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 4,717 4, uh, in here. And where there's a blue dot uh, or a blue color, that means that they had a typing result available, either positive or negative. Uh, and white was just absence of any data at all. And what you can see is that uh, the top two heat maps, they represent what was available using in the current blood donor, uh, blood uh, supply organization databases. And in the bottom is what was available when we inferred from genotyping. And you can see that by using genotyping, we have near complete antigen and blood group profiles for these individuals. Um, and that translated to a threefold, uh, 3.8 fold typing result increase. Uh, I think that was an average of 12 uh, per donor in the serology or the traditional data set. And in the genotyping data set, they had 47.9 on average. Um, and it's also worth me mentioning that in the genotyping data set, there were an additional 198 uh, antigens available. So really comprehensive typing available on these donors via genotyping. Um, and so you say, that's great, Nick, thanks for all this data, but you know, is it a load of rubbish? Um, so we obviously had to do a comparison between the positive and negative status for each of the antigens back. Um, and this figure here shows, so you can see A is kind of this sort of, uh, almost organogram, uh, but we did 96,000, um, uh, there were 96,000 antigen typing or blood group typing results available in the clinical typing on, in, in the blood supply organization databases. And via array typing, there were 1.6 million typing results available for. And that, uh, and that facilitated uh, 92,000 comparisons in total between genetic and serologically antibody defined blood group types. Um, and you can see we actually had a very, very low error rate. So there were only 73 discordances. Uh, and what I've tried to do is I've broken that down here by the cause of the discordance, because we actually investigated why we, we tried to determine why we thought that there was a discrepancy between genotype and phenotype. Um, and actually, if you have a look, you can see it's kind of, you know, there's a few algorithmic errors and a couple that we were unresolved, which means that we think there might be a novel antigen uh, and we need to do a bit more investigation uh, and biological confirmation. Uh, but really, um, the serological and array issues were sort of 50 50 um, and it was very very interesting to have a look into that they were almost equivalent with each other and so we see them as really really complementary technologies um, we also had a look at hla typing um, and we did just under 10,000 sorry just over 9,000 comparisons for different hla types using the same array data and the same donors uh, and we had 99.3% concordance. So this is not blood groups, but another type of, another antigen system that's important in transfusion and transplantation medicine. Um, and so we have all these typing results. They're very, very accurate by comparison, uh, but how useful is the data? Like how useful is it to have all these extra antigen types? Uh, and I think Connie and Willem were alluding to the impact that it can make, uh, but I thought I'd show you a plot that we made very recently um, and so 
uh, what we did is we took data from 15 years worth of complex patient referrals to NHSBT. Um, so this is patients who have more than three alloantibodies. Um, so, so they require quite specific matching, blood group matching. And in total, there were just over 7,000 cases. Uh, and in those 2,000 unique uh, blood requirements. Uh, so, you know, ABO, RH group, plus their combination of alloantibodies that they had to be matched for. And what we did is we just tried to find matches for each of those combinations in the 8,000 NHSBT donors uh, enrolled in COMPARE study um, that we now have genotyping for. Um, and you can see that we had just over 400,000 matches using the current serology, so without genotyping. And then with genotyping, that number jumped up to 1.2 million. And that's in the same individuals. Uh, and what this, oops, sorry. And what this figure here shows, this is the number of matches found using serology and the number of matches found using genotype. And each one of these dots re represents a different blood requirement. And they're actually shaded by the frequency at which they were requested from NHSBT or the frequency they appeared in these 7,000. And so you can see that it's very, very heavily biased on the genotyping side. And what this means is that if you have genotyping data, when you're looking for a complex match, you're much, much more likely to find it just because you have more typing results on them. And you can see that this might translate into really simplifying NHSBTs or any blood services logistical problem of providing blood for complex cases. Um, uh, another angle where the array data can be very, very useful is looking for uh, donors with highly desirable blood uh, types or rare blood types. Uh, and what I've done here is I've tried to illustrate using a very, um, a very easy to find uh, phenotype using genotype, basically. Um, and so the phenotype that I was looking for is Duffy A, Duffy B negative. Um, and this is a this is in high demand uh, for NHSBT. This is very valuable blood for them, uh, to, for providing for their patients. Uh, and this here is the genetic change, uh, one of the genetic changes that encodes this Duffy A, Duffy B negative phenotype. Um, and so we went genotype fishing in 550,000 individuals who'd been typed in various UK uh, geno uh, population genotyping studies. Um, and so here, this plot here shows the number of, uh, on the y-axis is the percentage of the cohort total that are homozygous for this variant. So they're definitely FYA neg, FYB neg, or, or really likely to be that phenotype. And you can see in compare, um, DIS3 and interval, um, you know, there was a very low percentage of those individuals who had this rare phenotype. Uh, but then if you look in the UK Biobank, which is 500,000 individuals and not a donor cohort, it's a, a population representative cohort, you can see that we find very, very um, many more units and a much higher percentage of the cohort actually have this phenotype. And what this illustrates is that genotyping is a fantastic uh, resource if you want to, um, you know, be more strategic about donor recruitment and finding individuals with rare blood groups. And so based on this work uh, that was published in Blood Advances uh, last year, um, there was obviously quite a lot of international interest. And I've just stolen one of Willem's slides from earlier to show you that the BGC has kind of rapidly expanded. So we've brought in um, the Canadian Blood Services, the South African National Blood Service and the Australian Blood Service, as well as the Finnish Blood Service. Um, and really the next step, um, uh, uh, the, uh, and we're going to together take the next step um, in this work. And so what we've been doing is we've again updated the array based on previous performance. So we're now um, in, the, in the process, uh, we're just about to start trialing the UK Biobank version 2.2 updated array. Um, and so if you've not seen a gene typing array before, this is what one looks like. Um, this is a cartoon just to show you what it's capable of. Um, and in particular, this version of the array uh, that the BGC have been working to design has been enhanced, uh, has been enhanced to improve blood typing performance, particularly uh, in uh, individuals of African ethnicity, where the genomics underpinning their blood group is much more complex. Um, 
We've also added other relevant markers for donor health. So much of the work that the BTIU uh, are producing and NIHR are producing is relevant to blood donors and comes from blood donor studies. So we've added um, markers which can give us uh, some measure of uh, different traits that are relevant. Um, so red cell storage lesion and hemolysis, uh, polygenic trait scoring for iron homeostasis and restless leg syndrome, and also the first few GWAS hits um, for fainting. Um, and we've also put on other, other uh, rare disease markers that affect donors, such as uh, sickle cell uh, and, uh, and um, hemochromatosis. But we generally excluded any uh, variants which type diseases that aren't directly relevant to blood donation and transplantation. And so we've also got the universal blood donor typing array. So this is a smaller format array. So the UK Biobank array types 800,000 variants and this version types 50,000 variants, but you can run many more samples, uh, 384 samples per run instead of 96. Um, and this has all of the relevant transfusion and transplantation content on there. Um, and also some of the uh, polygenic trait score markers. Uh, but is much more focused. You know, it doesn't have this um, imputation grid for doing genome-wide association studies on there. And that allows it to be used for much more specific purpose of donor genotyping. So the next stage in the project um, is to ascertain regulatory approval for the arrays. Uh, and this means that blood services can use them to produce regulated uh, clinical grade genetic blood typing results or blood, blood group genotypes. And so the plan is that the BGC members uh, will submit together 16,000 uh, DNA samples from donors. Uh, and this is the, this 16,000 has been built to represent the uh, genotypes and the individuals of each of the countries. Um, and they're going to be uh, genotyped in triplicate uh, currently at NHSBT, Sanquin, and the New York Blood Center, who are all going to have gene titans. And then we're going to do a three-way comparison between not only the inferred blood groups, but also at the genotype level. So you can see I've tried to illustrate that here, that we're actually going to compare not only blood types back to serology, but we're also going to compare them between each other and direct at the direct um, genetic genotype level. And then once we've done those comparisons, we'll then submit that for regulatory assessment to try and get the array accredited. Um, and so that's what's to come. Uh, so just finishing up, um, there's a huge number of people involved in this project um, currently. And I, I, I can't thank them all here. So I've just tried to include the BGC members and all the supporting individuals that are involved in these, um, in these projects. Uh, particularly like to obviously thank the people at the BTIU um, because, you know, without their data sets that they have produced, this project would have never, never been able to get underway. Cool. Thanks. Hello. Excellent. Well, th thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Connie, Willem, Nick. A great, great overview about the uh, group genotyping and um, hopefully the future of uh, in, in this area. So uh, we have a few minutes for a question. Uh, you can either unmute yourself or put your name in, uh, in the chat and I'll, I'll call you on. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll start with a question in the meantime while the other. So uh, uh, this is great work and it's really sort of looking forward uh, what would be the next step. What would be the major obstacle for implementing this kind of uh, uh, transformative way of, uh, of uh, of, of, of you know, identifying blood groups in donors and recipients. What, are the, what do you think are the main key obstacles that uh, as a service, a blood service, we need, we need to face? I could take that if you wanted. Or, I, yeah. oh, you go, Nick. Um, so I think what, one of the key obstacles is um, how to... It, genotyping gives you so much, so much more rich data on your donors um than has ever been previously available before and at a price point where it makes sense to start doing it on large numbers of donors so i think the key question at the moment for blood services is okay using genotype data and using blood group demand data how do we start identifying the donors that are high value and how do we start allocating blood uh, on a basis of um 
you know, maybe genotype matching or much better matching. I think that's one of the initial, um, and then also bringing the genotyping in house, um, you know, it's, it, it is a high throughput system and it will take some time to put the policies and procedures in place to, to allow that to be in a clinic done in a clinically accredited fashion. Yeah, I think maybe it's good to start with the patient uh, with the patient's needs and work from there. And I see Sarah, Sarah is on the call and is, has been an advocate of better matching for a long time because she sees the side effects of severe immunization. She might want to comment on that. But I think uh, if you go around the country and you ask uh, six to seven patient groups where all clinicians said, can we get better matched blood? Because we see too many problems in those patients. And I, I don't have to dwell on those, but it's pretty unanimous few in the UK, which groups that are. And then secondly, Emmanuel, all decisions in NHSBT about stock management are spreadsheet based. Yeah, mm -hmm. there is no artificial intelligence anywhere in the system. Mm -hmm. um, and NHSBT is am amazingly supportive in now showing the algorithms they use for managing the highly complex stocks. And the biggest translation is this, in the development of AI the validation of AI and the implementation of AI at two places in the hospital blood banks, which are 250 blood banks in the country. And secondly, um, in the donor management site as Nick said. Yeah, so this is a 10 year transformation program, but if Amazon can do it, then I don't understand why we can't. And I would just add, um to that concern, it, it's all about the IT support and, uh, you know, and development of that piece of the puzzle too. Um, and in the US, it's somewhat more of a challenge because um, there are so many different blood centers with so many different computer systems and they all have to be regulated and FDA approved. And so um, it's going to be a huge challenge um, going forward to get the artificial intelligence systems approved and um, usable. Right now we're doing a lot of genomic matching, like Willem said, um, with spreadsheets and, and it's not sustainable. So um, IT is the future here also. Excellent, thanks. So uh, I think there's another question from Sarah. I just wanted to thank you three for an amazing talk, but just also you and your larger group for the amazing work that you're doing that is truly essential if we're ever to deliver precision transfusion medicine. It's simply outstanding. And if you only saw um, what the impact of not being able to transfuse patients adequately or at all was, your heart would break. And you would, you know, if anyone saw that, they would be behind this project 100%. And it's not just, it's just awful to see, it's just pretty unacceptable. We clearly can deliver this. Now that you you, you and your team have sorted out the genotyping, it is, as Connie quite correctly says, it's down to the informatics and uh, you cannot do this manually. We deliver over seven and a half thousand units per month to patients with sickle cell disease. That is way beyond what human beings can match um, at all. So just a massive thank you for A, the talk and B, all the work you're doing, which is, going to, if we get the right support in the other aspects of this project, make it happen. So big thank you. I have one question to, I see Michael Buxton is on the, on the call and some other uh, people have been essential in, in the donor health studies. Um, I think the one thing, Emmanuel, when you asked what are the big issues is we need to take the donors with us in every step on this journey um, and uh, they are the basis of the patient care and we uh, what Connie and I have been doing is have been reviewing the information leaflets of eight blood services and it's very interesting from how transparent they are versus how non-transparent they are and I think it is really an important piece of public engagement and uh, donor uh, engagement 
which I know you team has pioneered, Emmanuel, but that dialogue needs to stay alive very much at each step that we make. And I know this has your attention, but it's essential if you go to genotype two thirds of the one, one half million blood donors that the blood donors are happy with that decision and understand why it is taken. Yeah, I completely agree with them. I think it's a, it's a very important point and that it's something that we really need to develop even further. And I'd just like to thank Sarah for her support because she, you know, she's at the bedside and um, she sees firsthand um, what we're trying to do here. And um, um, clinician support is, is key um, to drive this forward. Excellent. So, uh, and any other question from, from the audience? If not, well, you know, uh, thank you again. I think uh, it's really been a great pleasure to host you even virtually. Hopefully next time we'll be on a face-to-face, -face. but uh, it's been a great pleasure to have you here and really to see how things are transforming and evolving and will actually transform a lot of the, you know, treatment in, in, in this area. So thanks again and uh, uh, well, well done. Cool. Thank, Thank you, you Emmanuel.